Welcome to another deep dive into the night sky from Shenandoah National Park. One of the most recognizable features in the night sky is the Orion constellation. But what exactly are we looking at when we see this giant painting in the sky? We're going to look at the cultural stories first, then later in the video, we'll talk about the astonishing stars that make up the constellation and how Orion has the chance of becoming the most awesome, literally mind-blowing events of your life. There are eight easily recognizable stars in Orion. They make such a prominent humanoid pattern that they've been the inspiration of stories and myths for all of recorded human history. The earliest known depiction of Orion has been found in Western Germany in um, this cave. I'm not going to try to pronounce it. It was found in 1979 carved in mammoth ivory. This artifact is dated to around the year 33,000 BC. It's believed to be from the Aragnation culture, who were early modern humans in Europe. They seemed to be expert carvers, but at first it didn't exactly line up with the Orion constellation. That is, until researcher Dr. Michael A. Rappingluck wound back time 35,000 years. This accounted for how the stars had drifted over the past 35 millennia. Doing so made the stars line up precisely to the carving. The Orion constellation is found in the very first star catalogs humans created, going back to the Babylonians, who likely pulled their star names from the catalogs made by the Sumerians, which is one of the earliest known human civilizations. The Babylonians named Orion the Heavenly Shepherd. And ever since these very first records, there have been countless stories told about Orion. These are just some of the cultures with stories that have been recorded. As you can see, Orion is inspirational all around the world. One of those stories comes from ancient Egypt, where what we know as the Orion constellation was known as a god named Sa. In the pyramid texts written around 2400 BC, Sa was one of the many forms a dead pharaoh would take in the afterlife. Imagine the view on a cool, clear night in the Egyptian desert, stargazing over the recently completed pyramids with almost no light pollution. It gives me goosebumps. Another amazing story comes from a dark time in Japan's history. From the year 1180 to 1185, Japan had a civil war called the Genpei War. What does this have to do with Orion? On one side of the war, the Minamoto chose the star Raijo for its bright white color to represent their cause. The other side, the Taira, adopted Betelgeuse as their symbol cloaked in a bright red glow. The two stars represented the division the people were facing, separated by Orion's belt. I wish we had time to go into all of these stories, like how the indigenous tribe, the Ojibwe, named it the Winter Maker because of its prominence in the sky during this time. Or how in some cultures, the pattern isn't seen as a human, like in Polynesia, where it's seen as a child's hands playing with a cat's cradle. Or Hinduism, where it was a deer with hunting dogs. Or how in the Southern Hemisphere, where they live upside down in countries like New Zealand, the belt and sword are, understandably, seen as a saucepan or pot. Orion is even mentioned three times in the Bible, like in the book of Job, where Job describes God as the maker of the bear and Orion. And later, God speaks to Job and humbles him, asking, can you loosen Orion's belt? That's a powerful question. One of the more common stories of Orion today comes from Greek mythology. It's where we get the name Orion the Hunter. He was such a strong yet arrogant hunter that when he claimed he could kill every animal on Earth, the god of Earth, Gaia, sent a giant scorpion to kill Orion. When Orion died, the two were memorialized in the sky. And that's why the Orion and the Scorpio constellations aren't seen in the same sky. When one is rising, the other is setting, locked in an eternal game of cat and mouse. 
In the year 2021, when we're talking about our favorite shows with our friends, we ask, oh, what episode are you on? Can you believe what happened in the finale? I can't wait for next season. You know, we bond over these stories. Well, way before streaming, people shared their stories around the fire. The stories that they had heard from their parents and their friends, and that's how they bonded together. And it's how they entertained themselves. It is so inspiring to look at Orion with the knowledge of the stories of the past, but today we can look far deeper than ever before. So let's talk about exactly what we're looking at. As I mentioned before, there are eight easily recognizable stars in the Orion constellation. Many of their names come from Arabic, named during the Islamic Golden Age in the 9th through the 14th centuries. This model is roughly to scale, showing their relative size. As you can see, they are massive compared to the Sun. Now let's put them in their place in the universe. This is the view that we're used to, but if we were able to travel 600 light years to the right, they would be unrecognizable. We would see a completely different pattern. But I prefer our view. Now let's travel through Orion to the star that's farthest away of these eight stars. We have to travel an unfathomable seven quadrillion miles. The light that we see from this star has been traveling towards us for 1300 years, and we arrive to Alnilam. It's a blue supergiant star, about half a million times brighter than the sun. Being in Orion's belt, it's symbolically named String of Pearls in Arabic. Now let's travel up to Orion's head where we find the next closest star, Mesa, or the shiny one. It's around a thousand light years away. It's actually a triple star system. Although it's hard to confirm because of how far away it is, it's believed to be two stars and one brown dwarf. Brown dwarves are interesting because they're a substellar object. Too big to be a planet, too small to be a star, so they don't really fit in. I can relate to a brown dwarf. Coming closer to Earth, we find Mintaka, Arabic for belt, another blue supergiant star that's also a multiple star system. Moving another 100 light years closer, we find Alnitak. It's nearby some really cool nebulas, which we'll talk about later. It's Arabic for girdle, and it's also part of the belt. Then, not too far from Alnitak, we find the brightest star in the constellation, and the seventh brightest in the night sky, Rigel, Arabic for foot. It's just a baby star, only eight million years old. <laughs> so cute. But stars this big live fast and die hard. It's gonna end in a few million years with a violent explosion and possibly collapse into a black hole. Now let's swing around where we find Saif, Arabic for sword, another blue supergiant that's also next to some really cool nebulas. And finally, we have Bellatrix, the only name on this list that's not in Arabic. It's Latin for female warrior. At only 245 light years away, or 1.4 quadrillion miles, it's the closest main star of Orion. I guess we're lucky to have a warrior this close to home. Oh, wait a second. Looks like we missed one of the stars. That was only seven. Oh yes, how could I forget my personal favorite star in the night sky, Betelgeuse. Arabic for shoulder of the giant. Even to the naked eye, this star is not like the others. It is giant at 950 times bigger than the sun, and it's younger. The sun is five billion years old, while Betelgeuse is only 10 million years old. But why is it my favorite? Because do you know what the life expectancy is for a star this big? About 10 million years. That's right, Betelgeuse is going to die, and soon, as in possibly within our lifetimes. Okay, now for the truly mind-blowing stuff. Most elements in the universe are formed inside of stars, including the elements that make up the human brain like carbon, oxygen, and nitrogen. When a star finally burns off all of its fuel, the star's mass collapses towards the core. This creates so much pressure on the atoms that they almost instantly fuse together to become the heavier elements on the periodic table, like uranium, gold, and platinum. 
all of these elements fusing together creates so much energy that they then violently explode in some of the biggest explosions in the universe, a supernova. This spreads these elements across the universe where they later collect together again, which is what happened to the elements inside your brain that are processing this information right now. Like I said, it's literally mind blowing. The best part is we will be able to see Beetlejuice explode from Earth. In fact, we won't be able to miss it. It will outshine the moon at night and be so bright, you will even be able to see it during the day. Okay, I don't wanna ruin anyone's excitement, but I do need to be realistic. When I say it could happen any day now, that is unfortunately not on a human scale, but a cosmological scale. It's expected to supernova any time between now and the next 100,000 years, even still. Personally, I can't help but stare at Beetlejuice when I look at Orion, hoping that it explodes just as I'm staring. Although technically it would have to have exploded in the year 1381, since it takes 640 years for the light to reach us. Here's hoping for a cool 1381. Before I move on, one more fact. Beetlejuice's likelihood of exploding is related to its instability. It's what's known as a variable star, so sometimes it shines brighter than Rigel and is the 10th brightest in the sky. Sometimes, like in 2019, it suddenly loses so much of its brightness that it goes down to the 21st brightest. But when Betelgeuse does explode, it will stay very bright for weeks, then fade over a year or so until Orion is left without his shoulder. It might leave behind a black hole or a neutron star, but hopefully, for the stargazers of the future, it will add to Orion's beautiful dust cloud collection, things that are called nebulas. Thanks to modern technology like the Hubble Space Telescope and better cameras with better software, we can see deeper into space than ever before. This photo took over 200 hours just to capture, and it shows what's truly hidden inside Orion. Things that our ancestors never got to see. What a time to be alive. These clouds of dust and gas that the universe paints for us are the birthplace of new stars and planets. The main nebulas of Orion are the Flame Nebula, the Horsehead Nebula, the Monkey Head Nebula, and perhaps the most famous of all, the Orion Nebula. In a dark sky like the ones in Shenandoah National Park, you can see with your naked eyes that this patch of light isn't quite a star. It is a massive, diffuse nebula over 124 light years across. Inside it, we can see trapezium, four stars arranged in a trapezoid. Next to those, we can see early solar systems, with the main stars forming rings of dust around them. These rings clump together and then form planets orbiting the star. In fact, there are already 10 stars known to have planets orbiting them in the Orion constellation, some of which are in the habitable zone, where life as we know it could theoretically survive. The search for planets outside our solar system only recently started, so this is just a small fraction of the actual number of planets in the constellation. When we look to Orion and we see its humanoid figure decorating our sky, it's possible some life form orbiting one of those stars is looking back at us. Stargazing is an activity that gives us an important perspective to our lives here on this planet. And that's why we here at Shenandoah National Park are dedicated to making it accessible with minimal light pollution to allow for the public to stay curious and to stay inspired. Check out this photo. On the horizon, you can see the light pollution from Washington DC and Front Royal. That makes it much harder to see these beautiful stars. But here in Shenandoah, we make it a priority to keep our skies dark. You can check out some of our other videos to learn more about what is so special about Shenandoah's night skies and some of the steps that we take here in the park to protect our skies from light pollution. There are also some simple things that you can do that not only help preserve night skies, but save on energy and money too. 
You can also inspire your local governments and your local businesses to make night sky friendly choices. And we're gonna continue talking about that more in future videos. We have some of the darkest skies in the area, but whether you stargaze from your backyard at big meadows here in the park, or perhaps somewhere in a totally different park, we hope that this video gets you more excited to go outside and to look up. I'm Ranger Scott, and I'll see you around Shenandoah.